Of course, Brother Gene Hill has been the one to write on this and was scheduled to be here. But due to car problems, he could not make it. And since Brother Chumbly was on board in attendance but did not have an assignment this year, then we asked him to take care of both of brother, the brothers' um, sermons. And that he has done. But in the book, it will be Brother Hill's material that you will find. And Brother Ken Chumley is uh, a limey. I mean, he's a native of England. And uh, just don't call me a Yankee or we will have things for uh, He's the evangelist for the Belvedere congregation. And um, how close is that to, Ken? How close is that to uh, um, Valdosta? Long way. Uh, uh, well, Augusta. Augusta, that's what I'm trying to say. Oh. Okay. About 15 minutes from the okay, so that tells you sort of where that, that is. Excuse me, wrong word. Um, he's been working with them since about 2000. He's preached for over uh, 40 years. He worked in England for a long time after he was, um, had been converted and had worked over here for quite some time. And we're thankful for his good work and his dedication. County was a dear friend, appreciated his stand for the truth. He and uh, his wife, Linda, have uh, three children and seven grandchildren. And we're grateful he would help us at this time when we needed him to come speak. And he will be speaking on what is the Presbyterian Church. Could you come speak to us, Brother Ken? Certainly good to be able to be here this afternoon. I'd plan to come to the lectures and for one time in, in not quite a number of years just be able to sit through and enjoy the lectures. Appreciate the uh, cones for having me in their home. But when um, Brother Gene's car problems seemed to be uh, extensive, and by the way, I found out from him eventually via Facebook that he picked his car up at 5 o'clock last night. So it was a long job getting it fixed. But I was uh, glad for the opportunity to be able to fill in, and thanks to the wonders of computers and the internet, I was able to get to my file so that I could uh, have the quotations that I wanted from the documents, both of the Methodist Church from yesterday and today. And in the course of this lesson, what I plan to do today is follow the basic same format that I did yesterday, we will look at some of the history of the Presbyterian Church, or more correctly, Presbyterian churches, or those affiliated with Presbyterianism, because there are quite a few. And then we will look at the basic doctrinal situation by asking questions, seeing how they answer those questions, and seeing how the Bible answers those questions as we examine this church, this group of churches, and be able to show, I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Presbyterian church, the Presbyterian churches, are counterfeit churches. Presbyterianism goes back to one by the name of John Calvin, born in 1509, living to 1564. He was among the earliest of the Protestant reformers. He was born in France to Roman Catholic parents. He converted from Roman Catholicism in 1533, and during the next three years, he lived in seclusion after he had abandoned Roman Catholicism under assumed name. You know, it was dangerous in those years to leave Roman Catholicism for any reason. And as you study some of the works that uh, Brother Keith Sisman has spoken, uh, written about this in Traces of the Kingdom and other things on the website, you will see that it was dangerous. But nonetheless, he studied the New Testament in the original language, 
And although he didn't actually start a new sect in his day, he bears the honor or dishonor of being the founder by the doctrines that he perpetuated under the name of Calvinism. The five points of his distinctive doctrine are often called by the acrostic tulip, and we'll be examining this under the uh, study on doctrine. These Calvinistic doctrines are usually associated with Presbyterianism, but there are other religious groups that hold to these tenets. For instance, many of the Baptist churches, at least in their origins, are Calvinistic. And that's particularly true in England, where the earliest Baptist churches were actually apostate churches of Christ, that adopted Calvinism and then became Baptists. And as a result of being able to dig into some of their original documents, you can see they were established as Churches of Christ, but then changed not only their doctrine, but their name. Calvin followed a simple order of worship in which he emphasized much on the reading of Scripture and prayer, there was some congregational singing, usually not found in Roman Catholicism, and they sang out of a French translation of the Psalms, and interestingly enough, without instrumental music. The name, the term Presbyterian, comes from the Greek word presbyteros, translated elder in uh, translations. And so... Simply speaking, a Presbyterian church is a church that is governed by elders. But we don't have just a local congregation. Not only are there those within the congregation, there are the presbyteries, which would be local in a small geographical area, a statewide presbytery or a national presbytery on top of that. So they have a pyramid structure of church government. They're not basically independent congregations. The form of doctrine and government began, first of all, in Geneva, Switzerland. The concepts and the ideas of Calvin's teaching spread quickly to the country of Holland, the Netherlands, and to Scotland. Both of those countries became hotbeds, as we might say, of Reformation. And later on, in some countries, like with the church of, in, in Scotland, Presbyterian became the national established church religion. And interestingly enough, a little bit of information here. The Queen of England is officially the secular or titular head of the Church of England. But once her train or plane or whatever transportation means she is using crosses into Scotland, she becomes a Presbyterian, the Church of Scotland. And so being a national church, when you think of it, the Church of England is Episcopal. The Church of Scotland is Presbyterian. Now you have an Episcopal church in Scotland, it's the Episcopal Church of Scotland. Mainly in the English-speaking countries, a lot of them use the term Presbyterian, but not all. Uh, in Europe, the Reformed Church is the name that is often used, but they are basically Presbyterian. And also, originally, the Congregational Church. Well, mentioning Scotland, that brings us to John Knox, 1514 approximately to 1572. Born at Haddington, Scotland, had been a Roman Catholic priest. He went to Europe and there took up the Protestant courts. And through his leadership, Presbyterianism became the established religion in the nation of Scotland, as it was at that time. It was a separate nation and was quickly recognized as a great preacher. In 1559, the Roman Catholic Church was abolished by the Scottish Parliament 
And in the next year, the Church of Scotland came into existence when Parliament adopted the Scots Confession of Faith that Knox had had a great part in uh, authoring. But it wasn't until 1592 that it legally became the established Church of Scotland. Concerning the creed, the Westminster Association in session from 1643 to 1649 framed the standard creed of Presbyterianism both in the UK and in this country. And it is also recognized by other groups that hold to the tenets of Calvinism. There are numerous groups in the English-speaking world that are basically Presbyterian, going, as we said, by different names. Church of Scotland, the Free Church of Scotland, the We Frees, Presbyterian Church, the Congregational Church, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, United Reformed Terms, United Church of Christ, all have their roots in Presbyterianism. And today, some of these groups would not hold to all of the tenets of Calvinism, and some have become very modernistic and very liberal. But there are also, in some cases, cases, different denominations that bear some of these names. Let's move on then to the doctrine. Because this is where we're going to be able to see the contrast between the truth and error. Between that which is right and that which is wrong. Between that which is true and that which is counterfeit. We'll start off with the matter of salvation and ask the question, are we saved by faith alone? In the confession of faith, it states, faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness, is alone, the alone instrument of justification. Well, we turn to the book of James, James 1, 24 through 26. And there we read that man is not saved by faith only. The only time when faith and only appear in the scriptures, and it says that's not the only way it is. One is not saved by faith only. And we have examples in John 12, 42 and 43. The chief rulers believed on, many of them believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't confess him is they did not want to be put out of the synagogue. Why? They loved the praises of men more than the praise of God. Oh, they believed. But were they saved? No. Matthew 10, 32, 33 tells us, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Faith alone will not allow one to confess and thus allow the Lord to confess him. We want to touch on the matter of the Ten Commandments. Are we under the Ten Commandment law today? Presbyterianism teaches in the confession as such was delivered by God at Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and written in two tablets, the first four commandments containing our duty toward God, the other six our duty to one. Besides this law commonly called moral, the moral law doth forever bind all, as well as justified persons as others to the obedience thereof. In other words, part of Presbyterianism is the keeping of the Ten Commandment law. And thus, for that reason, oftentimes, and particularly you see this in Scotland, when you drive by a Presbyterian church building in Scotland or the Church of Scotland, and you look out at their signboard, it'll tell you Sabbath services. Well, you drive up there on a Saturday morning, and the building's locked and empty. They refer now to the Sabbath as being the first day of the week. The Bible never taught that. And again, when we look to the scripture, what do we find about the Ten Commandment law? 
When it was given in Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 3, we see that God made a covenant at Horeb not with the fathers, but even unto us, to the Jews. It was given to the Jews and the Jews only. As was pointed out the other day, those not Jews, those outside of the covenant relationship with God, were still under the patriarchal system, under patriarchal law, until the cross. Colossians 2, 14, uh, 2, 14 through 17 clearly tells us, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. You know, when you start teaching that we are not under the Ten Commandment law today, so many people will want to say, well, does that mean we can go out and kill? Does it mean we can go out and do this or do that or do the other? No. Why not? Nine of those Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. We have to obey them because they're part of the law of Christ. There's one that is significantly missing. And that's the one the Presbyterians want to hang on to. The Sabbath day. And what does it tell us in Galatians 5, 1 through 4, concerning those that want to hold on to the old law? Verse 4 says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. There are other passages as well, but we'll move on. Let's look at the matter of baptism now. Question, can baptism be rightly given by pouring or sprinkling? And again, looking at the confession of faith. Dipping of the person into the water is not necessary. But baptism can be rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. Now notice what they say here. Very specifically, the dipping of someone into the water, that is immersing them into the water, is not necessary. But one can be poured or one can be sprinkled. But when we look at what the Bible has to say, we find a conflict there. Because we find, with example, with John and his baptism, John 3, 23, why was he baptizing at Aon near the Salem? There was much water there. You don't need much water to pour some water or to sprinkle. In fact, uh, if sprinkling or pouring were baptism, I could do it any, to anybody in the room right now. Probably could do several with this amount of water. But there was much water. The same when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. That implies a going down into the water. You don't go down into a container to be poured or sprinkled. And then Acts chapter 8, 38 and 39 with the Ethiopian eunuch. They both went down into the water. Not into the flask that he was carrying on board the chariot as someone made reference to the other day. See here is water what hindered hindered me to be baptized. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Baptism is immersion. Romans 6, 4, and 5, we are buried with him by baptism. Immersion is Bible baptism. There is no instance, there is no example of pouring or sprinkling as baptism to be found in the pages of the New Testament. Another question. Are infants to be baptized? Again, notice what they state in their confession. Not only those that do actually practice, profess faith in obedience, uh, faith in and obedience unto Christ, but also the infants of one or both believing parents are to be baptized. Infant baptism. Well, 
Acts 8 and verse 12. It speaks concerning Philip's preaching in Samaria, that there were those that were baptized, both men and women. Not one mention of children or infants. And again, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, uh, Mark 16, 16. Do these little teeny tiny babies believe? How would they believe? How would they know what to believe? You know, as I said something about it yesterday, when I was sprinkled in the Episcopalian Church, the Church of England, I sure didn't know what was going on. And going to the Methodist Church, I witnessed a number of them. But all I got out of them was the only thing that they did, they made a confession in a sense. They screamed and hollered because they didn't like the water being sprinkled on them. But they knew nothing about what baptism was about. There's not one example. Oh, but there are household baptisms, as we mentioned yesterday. No evidence that there were any little children that were baptized, but that rather they were those who believed and obeyed. With regards to synods and councils, should synods or councils be held? Again, the confession of faith for the better government and further edification of the church, there ought to be such assemblies as are commonly called synods and councils. The whole idea being the Bible alone is not enough to guide the church. The local congregation is not capable of being able to guide itself with the word of God. They have to have these synods and councils that would meet together and determine whether or not this and so would take place. In fact, if you read some of the history of uh, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, you'll see what some of these synods and councils were talking about. Some of the things they got involved with. And by the way, when you get into really looking at it, you look about the old light and the new light, Burger or anti Burger, secede Presbyterian churches, these synods and councils were the ones that determined why there were so many splits. Well, the Bible tells us very clearly that all things have been put under his feet, that is, the feet of our Savior Jesus, and that he is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Ephesians 1 22 and 23. And our Lord himself stated, Matthew 28, 18, All power, all authority is given unto me. We need to look to the authority that Jesus has given. And he has enabled those who are apostles, inspired men, to record his word. We have the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. We have all we need to know to determine what's right and wrong. To determine what we should do and what we should not do. We don't need to go to an outside council that will make that determination for us. You know, one of the things I see about all these synods and councils, whether it be with the Presbyterian Church, Methodist Church, or... Christian Church. And one time I sat in on the conference that they had, the Churches of Christ in New South Wales, the Christian Church. I was a delegate for a week when I was part of that organization. And then to see what they kings they kind of discussed, and then passed down to the churches and made the determination what churches were or were not to do. The Bible makes it clear the only organization of the Lord's church on earth is found in the local congregation. There is no state, national, world headquarters. Each congregation that is fully organized, elders, deacons, and members, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Philippians 1 and 1. But let's move now to the Lord's Supper. 
How often should the Lord's Supper be observed? Now listen to this, from again from the Confession of Faith. The communion or supper of the Lord is frequently to be celebrated, but how often may be considered and determined by the ministers and other church governors of each congregation. You know, back in Scotland in the early 1800s, it was a quarterly thing. And if you read the history of uh, Alexander Campbell, he had to get a token in order to be able to be acceptable to partake of the Lord's Supper on that quarterly occasion. What does the Bible tell us? Acts 20 and 7, very clearly, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Their purpose was on the first day of the week. And we see not only from the scriptures, we look at the history of the church in the early days. History shows that the early Christians understood that when it says the first day of the week, it meant every first day of the week. That was when they met together to partake of the Lord's Supper. Not once a quarter or once a year or Tuesday, Wednesday or whenever you want to meet it, to have it. You know, some get the idea, well, if we can't be there on a Sunday, then we can... Just go ahead and do it when we get the opportunity. Well, I wonder about that. If you can't meet on the Sunday when the brethren meet, does it mean to say that maybe you are working 24 hours and can't take the time sometime in there to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week so you could just, well, when I get off work, I'll, when I feel like it on Monday, I'll do it. No authority from the Bible for that, whether it be Presbyterian or even some of our own brethren. The Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit work directly upon the hearts of men? Look at the General Assembly that was held in Los Angeles in 1903. There it states, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who moves everywhere upon the heart of men to restrain them from evil, incite them to good, and to persuade them to obey the call of the gospel. How does the Spirit work? Does he work directly on the hearts of individuals, as Presbyterian and some others teach? How did the Spirit work on the hearts on those of the day of Pentecost? Remember, Peter was preaching to them. And they were breaking their hearts and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What was it that they did? What came about? The preaching of the word. And as a result of that, they were told to repair to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins or the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38. And who is the Holy Spirit given to? To those who obey him. Acts 5.32. The idea of the Spirit speaking directly is not taught in Scripture. A great example of that's found in Acts chapter 8. How does the Spirit work when the Spirit was working miraculously? The Spirit told Peter to leave that great gospel meeting in Samaria, to go up the road that leadeth to Gaza, there he was told to join himself to a chariot. The Spirit taught the preacher where to go to meet up with the one who needed to be saved. You know, if the Spirit works directly, why bother with the middleman? He could have just gone and said to the eunuch, you're saved. But no, the preacher went unto him and he preached unto him Jesus. And as a result of that, 
He was immersed into Christ. Now we want to, in the final bit of time we have left, to just briefly go into the uh, tulip doctrine. T-U-L-I-P, an acronym to speak of the Calvinistic doctrines. Number one, total hereditary depravity. And we ask the question, are babies born sinners? You know, there are some little babies in this congregation. Some very young. Just over a week old, I believe the youngest is. Now we ask, are they born as a sinner? Look at what the confession of faith says. By this sin, they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. That's concerning Adam and Eve. And so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. They, being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. From this original corruption, whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil, do proceed all actual transgressions. There's a statement that's attributed to John Calvin that says there are some infants in hell not a span long. In Matthew 19, 14, our Lord said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Little children, he was using them as an illustration, not of sinners, but of the attitude of heart and mind that one should have to come into the kingdom. Ezekiel 18.20 tells us, The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now notice also another statement from Ezekiel in chapter 28, verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till sin was found in thee. Does that teach that one is born a sinner? We're told we're the offspring of God. In Acts 17, 29, does that tell us we're born a sinner? Remember, 1 John 3, 4 tells us, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Are these little tiny babies transgressed God's law? The next letter, unconditional election, the U. Has God eternally determined which individuals will be saved and which will be lost? Again, the confession, by the degree of, degree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men thus predestinated and foreordained are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or decreased. It says, if you are one of those who is destined to eternal life, there's nothing you can do to change that. But if you are foreordained to eternal death, there's nothing you can do to change that. If that be the case, what would be the point in preaching the gospel to anybody? You are the saved or you're lost and you don't know about it. And there's nothing you can do to change your condition anyway. Acts 17, 30 and 31 tells us, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he is appointed in the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by that man whom he hath ordained. Notice First Peter, First Timothy two, two and verse four: Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? If he's predetermined that every individual is either lost or saved, how can that statement of Scripture be true? Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. What would be the good of that statement? If you are eternally destined to be lost, as there's nothing you can do about it. Revelation 22 and 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him partake of the water of life freely. Does that sound like that you or I or anyone is so determined by God to be lost and there's nothing they can do about it? Now come to the L, limited atonement. Was the atonement of Christ only for the, le for the elect or for all? Again, listen to the confession of faith of the Presbyterian Church. All those whom God hath predestined unto life, and the, those only he is pleased in his appointed and acceptive time, effectively to call by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. Others not elected, although they be called by the ministry of the word and may have some common operations of the spirit, yet they never truly come unto Christ and therefore cannot be saved. Well, again, we could look at many scriptures. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2 and verse 2. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John three sixteen. For by the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Titus 2 and 11. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slackening concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Irresistible grace is the grace of God, irresistible. Those of mankind that predest are predestined unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid according to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his mere free grace and love without any foresight of faith or good works, or perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in the creature, as conditions or causes moving him thereunto, and to all the praise of his glorious grace. Can we resist God's grace? Second Corinthians 6 and 1 tells us, We then as workers together with him, Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Look at Hebrews 10, 29. Of how much so a punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of his of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite under the spirit of grace. Acts 7 and 51 speaks of those who resist the Holy Ghost. Acts 13, 46 is another passage that could be looked at in that regard. And then the P, perseverance of the saints. That's once saved, all would say. Is it impossible for one once saved to be lost? They whom God has accepted in his beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly preserve, persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Well, look at the parable of Luke chapter 8. 
Look at Luke 9, 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What about Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5, 1 through 10? Simon the sorcerer, Acts 8, 13 through 24. And go back to Galatians 5 and 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the Lord, ye are fallen from grace. And then there's passages like Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 and 2 Peter 2, 20 that we won't, because of time, be able to look at this evening. So as we think about the Presbyterian church, it's wrong on salvation when it comes to faith only or baptism. It's wrong in its teachings concerning the Holy Spirit. It's wrong in its worship. It has wrong authority. It's wrong on doctrine. And what we have done briefly has been able to pull off one at a time each of the petals off of the tulip to show that it is false. The Presbyterian church is indeed wrong. It is counterfeit. And when something is counterfeit, it is worthless. I give you a $20 bill. At least, I think it is. It's not, is it? Looks like it on the outside when you hold it. Hold it. But it's just as counterfeit as can be. In fact, it's a denominational track inside that is also counterfeit. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of fool that, try to fool people with that. But then so do these churches that are not what they should be because they are not the church of the Lord. They are counterfeit. We don't want counterfeit money. You know, sometimes we do get some counterfeit money, but it doesn't have any value. We don't want a counterfeit gospel. We don't want a counterfeit church because it has no value. We want the genuine, the real, the church that our Lord established according to his promise. Matthew 16, 18. Thank you. Since it turned out as it did, we couldn't have asked for someone better to do the job that he's done in filling in. We deeply appreciate it. Let me say again to those who will be hearing this as it's uh, video recorded, anyone here, uh, yes, we are calling this lectureship the New Testament Church and Counterfeit Churches. Some people get the idea, especially in this day and age, you just can't say anything's wrong. And if you do, that means that you're wrong for saying it's wrong. Well, we invite anyone, anywhere, to investigate the Church of Christ in the light of the right divided Bible. We would be more than happy to study with you if you think that the Church of Christ is wrong. Then we would be glad to sit down and listen to your objections. If there is something that we believe that we're doing or that we're not doing, that God expects us to do or not do, and you know about it, will you love us enough? Will you care for our souls enough to show us the way out of error? Jesus said the way to heaven is straight and narrow. The world says it's as wide as you can make it. Now, if Jesus is the Son of God, if Jesus loved us to give his life for us, and all that the New Testament says that he did, then surely we ought to know that he has the truth, the absolute objective truth concerning salvation. That when we get, as many have gotten in this nation, to the point and the world, to where we cannot stand to be examined, then something's bad wrong. So the next time anybody gets sick, don't go to the doctor and get an examination. Just wonder about it. And see with many diseases how far that gets you. 
So you see, we go against common sense so many times when we say, well, you go to your church, I'll go to mine, we'll all get to heaven together. You never found that in the Bible because it's not in the Bible. That sentiment's simply not there. So when we do what Brother Chumley did so well and these other men have done in laying these churches and their doctrines right alongside the last will and testament of Jesus Christ and then comparing and contrasting, surely that's the way we would do to find out the truth on anything when we have an absolute, objective, infallible standard to judge it by. And we do in this case when it comes to spiritual matters. So we just want that for the record. We're not trying to be mean and hateful and haughty, but we are trying to set forth the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth concerning salvation. And that's your obligation as well as ours. So we stand adjourned for about seven or eight minutes. Thank you.